welcome to episode 236 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian, starting my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. This episode is being recorded in advance as I am currently enjoying some time with my family. Tune in next week when I will read from the mailbag and give listeners shout outs. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Be sure to listen to episode 224. I announce a new sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs, and now is a chance to hear from one of Literati's team members, Lisa. Lisa Howard, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Amy. Glad to be here again. You know, it is the end of July, and I have been on vacation now for more than a month, but I am guessing that you and the folks at Literati are not on vacation right now. We are not, Amy. We are getting ready for a fabulous fall season. Well, and I mean, this is, it's kind of like busy time for you because you're getting everything ready. It is. We've got lots of inventory coming in. It's so much fun to see all of the great books that we've ordered actually come in the FCs ready to be packed. Excellent. I'd love to know more because we, we had a chance to meet you in our last episode. You know, librarians are always interested in the titles which are featured in the fair. Could you explain what happens sort of behind the scenes in determining the supply that book fairs receive to support their fair in particular? Absolutely, Amy. As you can imagine, there are many moving pieces that need to work in harmony to support each book fair. From an operations standpoint, it starts with our inventory, reviewing our on-hand balances, working with the data algorithm team on trends, working with the curation and product buying teams on what's new and what's exciting that's coming in. And then we work on the layout or merchandising of the fair that we do in collaboration with our marketing team. From there, the ops team does a line set. That's what we've been doing all summer long, getting ready to support the newly updated merchandising plan to ensure each fair is packed to the product buying and merchandising spec for every module or fixture that makes up a fair. We take into account the number of titles by category, prior trends, marketing trends, space planning for the fair's overall footprint, to ensure every fair has a great title mix, both in breadth and depth, that will delight kids of all ages who will be attending the book fair. We also continuously review fair data during the season to stay on top of the kids' buying trends and make adjustments to packing rates based on fair history. If we see something selling at a much higher rate than we forecasted, we partner with the buying team or go back and see if we can procure additional copies to support the higher sell-through rate on those popular titles. We make every attempt to ensure the book fair is stocked with enough inventory to support the projected fair revenue that the school shares with us during the booking process. However, there could be some titles that sell better in certain fairs than others and outperform those original projections. We also have a replenishment process that we use to help ensure that the school stays in stock. That process enables them to order either online or at the fair take a paid order, and then we ship it directly to the school, directly to the chairperson, with a packing list that has the student and the teacher's name for easy distribution at the school. Okay, so I'm in awe. But, you know, I'm aware that day in and day out, I am reminded I am very good at my job. I am a very good librarian. I could not today decide, you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to open a bookstore. (laughs) I have zero business acumen. I, everything you just talked about reminds me that you are bringing a, a living, breathing bookstore, transplanting that into our space, albeit for, you know, a a, a temporary period, but you're doing all of the thinking for me because all the things that you've described, I don't possess those words, but I appreciate that you're cognizant 
of what's happening in my book fair as it's happening. Absolutely. With the point of sale system, Amy, we're able to see what's selling at that current fair so we can help with the buying trends and understand what we need to see on top of. It is a miniature store inside thousands of fairs, schools every day for all those kiddos. Okay. I'm really grateful that somebody is doing that for me because I'm listening to you. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm never opening a bookstore, but I'll be happy to have one of your book fairs in my library because I don't have to do any of that thinking. Lisa Howard, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for working so hard to make sure that when people have a literati book fair, they've got a really great team that is supporting them in this process. Thank you so much, Amy. And there's a team of hundreds behind me. So we are here to help support. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Lisa. I'm sorry that you're so busy, but I'm glad you're so busy. Thanks, Amy. Bye-bye. Friends, tune in to learn all about Literati and their generous offer. Librarians who book their first Literati book fair for this upcoming school year and mention the code UNITED will receive a $500 gift card from Tidal Wave. As always, there's a link in today's show notes. And now a word from Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I am grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, VR and Building Empathy, and my conversation with Andrea Trudeau. Andrea Trudeau, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. It's great to be here. You know, you and I go way back to peak pandemic, October 2020, and one of our 14 virtual focused episodes, episode 94, Virtual Burnout and Self-Care. I want to thank you for stepping up because this is one of the pandemic episodes and it was recorded during a particularly difficult time for everybody. Yes. And it's it's funny because I still now I, you know, I'm thinking back to those times when I was a dining room librarian. And now that I'm a, a dissertation librarian <laughs> working on a dissertation, I find myself at the dining room table yet again. <laughs> but but for a, an entirely different reason and, yep. and one that's to be celebrated, you at some point during the pandemic, was that that epiphany to to pursue a Ph.D.? Did that come? at any significant time during during the pandemic, or is this just completely separate and, and distinct from the pandemic? It actually came before. So I started my degree the summer of 2019. So yeah, so I had just started and it was supposed to be a hybrid program. So I was supposed to be going in person partially. Yeah, that never happened. I've basically been completing my entire PhD completely online, which has really challenged my skill set, but now I love it. So it's good. Absolutely. Well, and I think we've all learned there's a great deal you can accomplish remotely. And um, we're just going to use that to our advantage in so many different aspects of our lives. Absolutely. So what you and I could not have possibly known in October of 2020 was that in the summer of 2023, you and I would be hanging <laughs> out in Chicago for ALA's annual conference. Woo-hoo, that was such an amazing week. I had so much fun with you. And everyone. I mean, so many great school librarians that we met that week. And friends, I, I'm not going to lie. Um, we descended. And when I say we, there was more than a few of us who uh, stayed at uh, uh, Shea Trudeau, uh, <laughs> the, the Hotel Trudeau. And uh, and I'm going to tell you, your family was incredibly hospitable and generous. I don't know many families who would have uh, agreed to um, be uh, it was like locusts. We sort of, you know, descended like locusts. And, and you were incredibly uh, hospitable. And I am so grateful because being able to crash at somebody's house for a couple days when you're going to a conference as 
um, it's just a very large and loud, and there's a great deal of chaos when you go to a conference. To be able to retreat to the quiet of your backyard, I'm sorry, you have you have a beautiful, beautiful backyard, and we just sort of sit there and enjoy the garden and and be able to relax a little bit. Yes, I definitely am the same way. I need that time to recharge. And I'm sorry that construction on 90 was so bad, but it was worth it to be able to get back to my house and, yeah, hang out. So such a pleasure to have all of you. You were my first house guest post-COVID, so, you know, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, and, and again, I, I, I'm not kidding, friends, when I say there was quite a few of us there at any given time. Your, your family was incredibly understanding. So, Andrea, let us know where in the country you work. Tell us about your current libraries, some of the, what the grades you support and the programs you teach. Because I, I know 2020, October 2020 was a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I am a middle school library information specialist. I like to call myself a no shush librarian. I uh, just finished my 25th year in education, which is insane because I don't know how that's possible at this point, and I feel so young still, but um, that was my, I'll be going into my ninth year in the library this fall, and I work with um, about 450 students, grades six through eight in a public school just uh, north of Chicago in a town called Deerfield, so it's, it's, it's Allen B. Shepherd Middle School. I'm really lucky to work on a flex schedule. So having such strong relationships with all the staff, having worked with them for so many years, and then having this flex schedule really allows me to make a lot of magic in my library. There's a lot of trust, a lot of solid relationships. So um, I've got a lot of staff members that I like to say they trust my crazy. So we get to do some pretty amazing, innovative, human-centered things in my library. It's a very dynamic, active space. Well, and I wouldn't even, I, I really would describe more of what you're doing. I mean, it's so innovative. And I, I think your teachers recognize that you've done the work. I mean, you, you've, you've already worked through some of the, 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 you've worked through the learning process so that you're in a place where you're prepared to teach it to their students. So I'm not saying that they're able to take a backseat, but they're going to let you take the steering wheel. Like you get to drive this, this, uh, this, uh, you know, lesson that that's happening in this space. And it really does put them in a place where they can enjoy some of the hard work that you've put into creating something really innovative for their students, for the students that you share. You are currently a PhD student, and I'm hoping that you'll let listeners know a little bit about the focus of your research because it is very relevant to today's conversation. So basically, I mean, I could go on and on about this, obviously, but simply put, it's I'm looking at uh, virtual reality and the impact on empathy. There's a lot of research out, out there that looks at this topic, but it tends to focus more on college age students and adults. And so um, Chris Melk, who's this amazing uh, VR videographer, and I'll make sure you get the link to this. He has a TED talk he did in 2015 where he said that VR was the ultimate empathy machine. And of course, researchers go running, they want to test this, and they focused most of their research studies on adults. And so given my experience and observation, I was like, I think this is doing something with adolescent students as well. And it's important to know when we talk about empathy, there's kind of two parts to it. One is this idea of cognitive empathy, being able to Put yourself in someone else's shoes. We also call it perspective taking. And then the other element is called affective empathy with an A. And that is when you actually feel what someone else is feeling. And the idea is, is if we boost empathy, and we know as librarians, we do this all the time through books because, you know, routine Sims Bishops, Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors, books are powerful for promoting understanding and empathy. But I really think that VR has the potential to um, enhance what we do and sort of um, embody and extend Bishop's work and really help create this idea of um, in-group thinking. So instead of looking at someone who might um, initially look different, being able to find those similarities and find commonality, there's all this amazing research about how it changes aggressive behavior. It can overcome bias. There's so much that it can do to benefit our students. Well, and I I can't help but think, you know, sometimes empathy is something that a a child or an adult might get by living, by moving and living someplace else. If you, and and you have sort of this opportunity, I know um, one of our kids did a semester abroad and all of a sudden has your eyes wide open to how other people live 
and how perhaps extraordinary your own set of circumstances might be. I mean, the, that, those perspectives, sometimes you have to be transplanted to, to be someplace else. Maybe it's just camp or, or something like that. But, you know, that kind of experience is, is very difficult to replicate, especially if you're working with a classroom full of students and you're talking about field trips and logistics of moving all of these kids. It, it would seem to me that while many people might point to VR and say, that's expensive, uh, I would counter, you know, counterpoint, it in no way can compare to moving all of these students in this class to a field trip experience that would involve putting them on a form of transportation. You know, I don't mean to like spiral, but it's like, wait, this is like, this is bargain basement. How you get kids to get a, a window into somebody else's life and they're still sitting in your library space. Yeah, I mean, that's the magic. I always, I I know I said this in my presentation, you attended at ALA, but it's it's like we get to be Mrs. Frizzle and ride the magic school bus. Like we get to take them on the school bus and go to these places. So it's such a way to provide access. You know, there's there are children that don't have the pleasure of traveling the world. So to be able to bring the world to them and provide that access. And, you know, these experiences are, are very immersive. Like you're in this headset and the equipment is going to respond to your movement. So it's going to feel like you're there and you're, it's this sense of embodiment. Like you actually feel like you're there. You could even feel like you're in someone else's shoes. So it's really powerful stuff for sure. I was incredibly lucky to be in the audience when you and Amanda Jones presented at ALA's annual conference this summer in Chicago the title of your session, Using Virtual Reality to Explore the World Around Us. I was grateful that you and Amanda didn't presume a great deal of VR prior knowledge from your audience because I, I needed some hand-holding. Yeah, I mean... I've always tried to approach it that way. Anytime I'm dealing with technology in my library, just in general, like you just never know what people are going to know and you want to meet them where they're at. And I think especially with VR, we were all kind of fast and furiously working with it before COVID and then COVID hit. And the last thing I wanted to do was put a headset on a kid's face and share headsets. So it kind of got put on hold. So I almost feel like we're kind of re-emerging and have to kind of figure out like, what do we know? What do we have available to us? What can we do? So yeah, anytime I present, I don't want to assume anything. I want people to feel like comfortable. And my goal is, you know, Amanda and I just wanted to make sure we gave all kinds of great information of things that we had tried. So everyone would be maybe better understanding VR, but then have some tools and tricks that they could put into place when they get back to their school libraries. Well, and French, you better be sure one of the things we always ask of our guests is that you share your work product. <laughs> and and friends, I, I've discovered that this really is unique to school librarians. You know, we are always wanting to make sure that when we work hard and create something in our own space, this is something that others could replicate in their space or set as a goal as something that they'd like to do, perhaps write a grant or two. And so definitely make time for the show notes in today's episode, because when I, I know you and Amanda put a great deal of work into this presentation, because in order to get it accepted by ALA, you know, you've got to jump through all of these hoops uh, in that process. So we are going to benefit those of us who didn't get to go to ALA and see you present live are also going to be able to benefit from that entire presentation. I'm very grateful for you to do that. You know, I have never worked in a library with VR headsets. I've seen them at like an ISTE conference. Your presentation included a great visual titled 10 Reasons to Use VR in Your Classroom, which I believe you created with Maria Galanis. Is that correct? Yes, Maria Galanis. Yes. All right. And, and I'm hoping, you know, that you will uh, identify which of these reasons really motivated you to pursue the kind of program that, that you would like to do in your space. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for mentioning that sketch note. That was something that Maria and I worked on kind of early in the VR adoption in my school. Maria comes from the ed tech space. She works in my school district as a tech specialist. And then we worked with uh, Sylvia Duckworth, who's very well known for her incredible sketch notes. She's got books. Her website's amazing. So shout out to Sylvia for creating this really cool sketch note for us. But Hands down, the most uh, powerful reason to use VR to me is is that number two on the sketch note, which is 
developing empathy. And kind of, as I said before, it's, we as librarians know that books can take children to different places and they provide those mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. But another part of our job as modern day school librarians is really harnessing this technology. And I feel like librarians are at the forefront. We are these trailblazers. And so this is just another tool that we can harness to complement the curricular work, the reading, the research in order to provide these really powerful sliding glass doors for kids. Well, and I, I do think that the library slash learning commons is a great place if you are to house a, a collection of these VR headsets. It makes all the sense in the world to put it in the place where every single student would have access to said technology. And I think that whenever we're writing grants, we need to emphasize the fact that we are the school's classroom and we are the place where every single student can have access to these resources. So uh, definitely make sure that that, that is uh, something that you include when you are thinking about writing. Uh, usually it's a grant or a proposal to a foundation because you would like to acquire some some VR headsets. You know, am I right that your early use of VR in the library is what is driving your PhD research? Yes. Okay, so story time. <laughs> when I first became um, a school librarian, I attended uh, like a small little suburban uh, tech conference here in Chicagoland and was with Maria, my friend that did the sketch note with me. And we were having lunch at the end of the conference and there was like a little raffle at the end of the lunch and she won a Google Cardboard. And we're looking at this thing because it said just come out and it was flattened, it wasn't put together yet. And we're like, what is this thing and what does it do? So we open it up and we realize that you can just put your smartphone in it. And if you have the right app, you could go to any place in the world. So I immediately was like, oh gosh, I'm going to take this idea and run. I had been a long time um, ELA teacher, but also had spent a couple years teaching seventh grade social studies where the focus is geography and world cultures. So immediately my brain was like, I want to take the kids on a virtual field trip and take them someplace in the world they've never been. So I ended up finding, um, you know, the money from my PTSO, they bought me a couple more cardboards. I think I had a total of like three to five. And at that time, they were about $15 each, so fairly inexpensive. And I found an app by RYOT, which is, I think was through Huffington Post. And they had a short little video about refugees. And it was basically these refugees were coming from, um, you know, from, from Aleppo and they were landing on the shores of Greece and so you put the headset on and you can look up at the sky, look down at the sand, look out at the ocean and you see the boat coming in and all around you, it's like all around you, you hear the cries, like cries of joy, cries of help, like, cause there's people on the shore, we like waiting to help the people get out of this boat and make it to, to land safely. So the video is about two and a half minutes. I was fortunate to have um, a colleague of mine, Tom Samoran, who just retired. He was a seventh grade social studies teacher. I said, can I make a station with your classes and have every kid cycle through and do this? Now, we asked the parents permission to download the RY RYOT app on their phones. We're fortunate to be in a district where many kids had smartphones and fortunate to have parents that were really supportive of this idea. So a free app, put it in. Kids watch this. They learn about refugees like they normally do in our curriculum. And there was richer discussion. So I'm like, well, this is great. This is really working. But fast forward to eighth grade, and these same students now are in, you know, eighth grade history. And the teachers had a family come to them, uh, you know, graduating family, and said, you know, we have these refugees coming to our area. We're going to create this welcome wagon site, and we need to have students create videos to help this family assimilate. So the family was a mom, a dad, and two small children who had fled Syria. They had lived in a Tur Turkish refugee camp for two years with just like backpacks, and that's all they had. They knew no English. They knew nothing about living in the United States. So I'm talking with this, the history teachers, and, and we're thinking, okay, let's do this after school. These eighth graders are so busy. We're going to get like five kids, but we'll make it work. It'll be fine. I was blown away. It was standing room only, Amy. We had like 60 or 70 students in that room that day, and they were so excited to help. They were making videos. They were running around the building making videos about like how to use a vending machine, how to use a microwave, 
um, a couple of girls were like, we need to educate this little girl on the Disney princesses. So it was phenomenal. And we were able to put these videos on this private site. So these, these families that came could watch it as many times as they wanted. So to me, that was like such a pivotal moment. And that is where this was well before I, I started my PhD. I realized that this technology has such power and um, it was doing all the things I hoped that education would do for kids. Cause you know, I am in a very privileged community and these kids travel the world, but they stay in really fancy hotels and they don't really get to see how people live. And I feel like it's my responsibility to kind of burst the bubble a little and help them understand how most of the world is really living and help them realize that they need to tap into their knowledge and resources to help others like this pro-social altruistic behavior. That is exactly what the VR did. And it was that moment I'm like, this is what I want to study. You know, I, I, I can't help but think, you know, as a parent, there were times when, and, and friends, my, our children, my, my children are adults. And so uh, there was times when they were younger where honestly the threshold for me was just raising like decent human beings. I wanted my children, that was all I wanted from my child, I just want you to be decent human beings. And isn't that strange that when you have that realization, you're like, okay, I need to teach you to be a decent human being. I see how VR, and because you are finding yourself, you can't, it's like you're opening your eyes you're, and you're face to face. It's like you can't turn away from it. You know, I, I think it's so easy when we're teaching students for them to give us part of their attention. Give it, they could be, looking at us, but not really, because you know what? They're really in. They're just off in Twilight Zone. They're off doing their own thing. And and because it's wholly immersive, this is, and it's, and forgive me, but VR, it oftentimes feels more like a video game because they are also in that it's, you're in this world. And that's something that they, they can readily sort of say, okay, I'm here. I'm on board. Like you're, it's not like you're meeting them where they are, but you're providing them with an interface that isn't foreign to them. Like they're like, I can, this feels real. And I just think like, like all we're doing is helping them just be decent people. Administrators love when we can connect the things that we are doing to teaching standards. So in what way do you, have you found that, that VR supports academic standards for our students? We have been able to apply VR in pretty much every setting across the board um, over time. And that's both creation of like consumption-based tools, you know, apps that are already created that we just watch and absorb and then talk about or creation-based tools. But the research, and this is the, the you know, what administrators want to know, the research says that it's, it does do all kinds of great things. It can build background knowledge. So, you know, I know for my students, we study the Holocaust. It's a standard requirement here in Illinois. And so we do a an adaptation of Anne Frank's diary and the kids are able to, it's like a play. And sometimes the play format's really confusing. So I have an app, Anne Frank's house, and they get to go and look at Anne Frank's house and explore it. So they understand the setting where the story takes place in this play before they watch, you know, actually read the play and, and discuss it. It does facilitate deeper learning. And that happens because kids are definitely more motivated and engaged, kind of like you mentioned. And what's interesting is, is, you know, there's some question about, is it because it's this novel technology? Is that why they're so interested? But in the study that I did uh, recently, 86% of my students had already used VR before, but it still promoted a massive increase in empathy. So I think the novelty is kind of a non-issue, to be honest. I think it's that, like you said, you're in this immersive space. It's commanding your attention. There's this sense of presence, a sense of embodiment, and it's right there in your face. So you're you're engaged. Uh, it also promotes critical thinking. There's a lot. There are some VR tools that um, do a lot of problem solving. So a lot of the VR that's out there right now is focused on you know STEM and science. So you might have to tinker and try something and create new iterations of something until you solve some kind of problem. It also boosts empathy, which is what my research is focused on. And then it really does lead to higher academic achievement and long-term knowledge retention. So they've looked at both short-term and long-term, our kids understanding concepts, and that is the case. And I think it is because they are so engaged. What I think is great is it's just a great way to bring experiential learning to our classroom. You know, when Cole created this, this model of experiential learning in 1984, it was about 
going to this place and doing these things with these authentic tools and these experts. Well, now we can bring that right into the classroom. And, you know, experiential learning is a spiral. It's, it's something that's continuously happening. So we can harness these different tools to support that. And like we said, it's that whole idea of being able to harness our, our Mrs. Frizzle and, and get on the magic school bus and go inside of a plant cell. Or maybe you want to go back in time and you get to watch Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak or go to the depths of the ocean that we could never go because it would be too unsafe to go there. So I love the idea that it has the potential to really support all academic areas. In social emotional learning, I do mindfulness stations with VR and kids are doing deep breathing and de-stressing in VR. And so that's a way to, you know, harness this. There's the consumption tools, the creation tools, and I think more and more is coming out. So it's really an exciting time. Well, and as you said before, What you discovered was that the students who had done the, not a, a, you know, sort of a VR experience as seventh graders, then as eighth graders were more, do you feel they were more receptive to this assignment that was going to be created about supporting this incoming family, this opportunity? They were far more receptive because of something they had done a year ago? I know, right. See, that to me was astounding. I mean, and I... You know, I work with middle school students who are very egocentric. They're about themselves. And so for them to give of themselves in this way, it stopped me in my tracks. I I think that makes all the sense in the world. So, Andrea, I'm always sharing. Friends, I get terrible vertigo. I get motion sick just watching people play video games. Like I cannot, like I used to come up behind my kids and watch them play video games. I'm like, nope, can't do this. I was like, no, I am, I am not feeling it. So how can I enjoy VR? Because if I'm somebody who easily gets like, just, I just find it very unsettling. So is there something that I can do and I'd still participate if I'm one of those students? I'm sorry that that is, you're one of the chosen ones. Um, I think this is, the research shows that that is one of the realities, that there are physical effects that we have to be aware of. The research shows about 5 to 10% of people experience it. And I would say in my observation of students, that's pretty much hits the mark. So some students will, you know, have physical discomfort, like dizziness, headaches, nausea. And so what I do is before I, we do any kind of VR excursion, I warn them of these and I tell them, if you know you're one of these people, I'm going to ask that you decline the use of the headset so we can come up with an alternative for you. But I also say, if you're in there and this starts happening, please speak up because I have no way of knowing that this is happening to you. And it's just a, a good lesson in self-advocacy. I just want to make sure that they have, you know, are safe and feeling good. So when I do any of these activities, I always try to provide an alternative. I've been really fortunate with a lot of these cinematic VR films that there is a like a two-dimensional 360-degree version that's available online. Oftentimes it's on YouTube, actually, so they're free. And what's cool about that is, is so for example, I used to film in my study called The Displaced, which you can throw on the headset, or you can go through New York Times on YouTube and... It's 360, so you can just, you know, blow it up full screen and manipulate around. And you're not as immersed, but it is still a pretty darn cool experience. And you're able to kind of see everything and you're still face to face with these individuals. So I think it's really important that we always try to find those safe alternatives for kids. I do appreciate that, you know, with these digital natives, while I had to find this out, they knew about it a lot earlier because they've been exposed to these types of of experiences at a much younger age. VR headsets can be expensive and something that not all library programs have factored into their budget. Have you any advice on how to build a collection of VR headsets? How many would you recommend starting with if we can't purchase like a class set from the very beginning? I mean, my, my greatest advice to everybody is to start small, not just for the financial end of it, but also for the management and like confidence building of it, because it can be kind of intimidating to take on this kind of task. And VR headsets are different. I, I, I will be totally honest with your listeners. There isn't one headset that does it all. I use MetaQuest headsets. Um, Amanda Jones, who I co-presented with, she loves class VR. 
There are pros and cons to both. I would, you know, if I could have all the money in the world, I'd love a set of each, but that is not the way that it works. So for me, I would say um, start with a just a station of a couple headsets, maybe just like two or three, even one, one will do something. And um, maybe it's something where you could set it up in your maker space or you have it as a, like a little station within a classroom that you're collaborating with. But I think the key is, is you want to feel successful. You want to make sure that it works with the infrastructure in your school. And also you want to use it as an opportunity to maybe do some observation, collect some data, because what you find is you might get some good information to take to an administrator or use for a grant in order to harness more funding when you're ready to expand your collection. So... I'm just going to throw myself out there. And friends, I am always willing to admit when I know nothing about something. And this is there's a reason why I was sitting in this session, because I truly have just a very, very scattered understanding of what a VR is. And I, I have uh, put a headset on. And that's when I was like, nope. I need this to end now. I was doing the space station uh, simulation and the walking the plank off the 33rd floor. And I was just, it was, it was really upsetting for me. But how do you, what instructions do you give to your students? Because if multiple kids are wearing headsets, I appreciate if you have like one, you'd have to, you don't have to worry about them colliding with too many other people. But if you have multiple kids, what kind of instructions do you give to them about physically moving around a space if they've got a headset on their head? That is an excellent question. Most of the time we stay seated and we're fortunate to be in a school that has chairs on wheels. So they kind of know the table is there. There's like a table station and then they can still kind of circle around or look around. But I've had a couple kids that like start getting up and moving and I'm like, oh, you're going to run into someone or run into, you know, you're going to run into a wall. So I will very kindly like whisper and say, I'm behind you. I'm going to move you. We're going to sit you back down. Yeah, I pretty much keep them seated. But there are people um, in the Google Expedition days, which is no longer in existence, there are people that would make it like, you could make it like you're walking a bridge and they create these like physical um, accommodations in the room where there'd be rope and you could feel the rope while you're wearing the headset. I did not venture into that space too much because I was too worried about the safety of my students. I, I just could see somebody just really getting into it and lose it and forgetting themselves, you know, for, forgetting themselves. Oh, you? Yeah. Yes. What's great, though, is about MetaQuest, the one that I have, there's like a play space. So if you start to get outside of like this boundary you've created, you get almost like a weird black and white like overlay, like it'll suddenly show you the space you're in. It looks kind of fuzzy and greeny. So it lets you know like, oh, you're not in the film anymore. I now see the library shelves. They're just black and white. Oh, I better back up. So at least the technology is realizing like this is an issue. Well, and, and let's be fair, as with all technology purchases, there is going to come a time where what you have has been sort of surpassed by the next generation of VR headsets. And, you know, I think we have to, and this is something that ed tech people have already come to grips with, but whenever we invest in technology, we have to do so with the awareness that it is a moving target. It is constantly evolving. What we have will become outdated. Yeah. And I mean, for me, that's sooner than we'd from like. From that perspective and also the sheer management, I only have a, like a half class set of headsets. Because to do the whole class at once, oh, that would be a, a management nightmare for me using Meta. Uh, class VR is a different beast. It's it's built for education. And so there's a teacher dashboard. It's easier to push things out. So I think you have to be cognizant of what equipment you're using. And for me, having 15 headsets, because a couple might poop out a network, um, is, it, is plenty to run it on a class. And it may be that it takes one or two days for everybody to see it, but everyone will get to see whatever we're working on. So... Well, and the reality is that by the time technology is something that the typical uh, educator can afford in a budget, it has already been surpassed. You're going to be buying something that that is that is has limits, and it's always going to be the case that somebody at home has something way fancier. <laughs> Absolutely, but those people are great because they'll help you troubleshoot when stuff comes up in glass. <laughs> And, and we do have those, they, they, they make themselves known very quickly. I have one of these and you're like, excellent, I, I need a helper. 
Come right, get, guess what you just volunteered for? You are going to be my helper. And I know that's the case with like maker spaces and our 3D printers. There's always going to be one of those rock star kids who steps up and says, I know how to do this. <laughs> Love those kids. And and I'm just going to date myself. But friends, I got an A-plus in home economics because I started the class already knowing how to thread a Singer sewing machine. And I am not kidding. I This is a memory from seventh grade. I got an A-plus in home ec. And because my teacher, Mrs. Mope, said, uh, friends, if you need any help, Amy will help you thread your sewing machine. I already knew how to thread a sewing machine. And I was like, I'd be happy to help you. And I could get there early and thread all their machines for them. And I got an A+. And yes, I am ancient, friends. Skills are all coming back. My children have sewing in their classes now, too. And they didn't love it. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, there was a time, especially when I taught elementary uh, library, that lice was a very, like, a daily concern. Lice was a daily concern when I taught elementary. And so headphones, stuffed animals, many of these things were removed from the classrooms because people were worried about lice. And, you know, since COVID, we're always looking for ways to disinfect surfaces, which get a lot of use. What has been done to make VR devices and shared similar devices, which are shared, less worrisome for your families? Yeah, these are very valid concerns. And I have to say, I'm really grateful for the newest iterations of this VR equipment because um, my first headset was the cardboard. And so students would plop the phone in there, put it up to their face, take it off, and then it looked like the bottom of a pizza box because, you know, the oily T zone. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what, friends? When I envisioned a podcast to talk about school librarians and the challenges we face, the oily T-zone on the cardboard VR was not one of those things, but here we are. This is what happened. Here we are. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, is, this, this is what I bring, everybody. Uh, so I was literally at that time taking like duct tape and like cutting it out into these little shapes to put it on there because I could wipe the duct tape down. So now we've figured it out. I think some of the earlier VR headsets had these foamy pieces. Again, gross, because you'd wipe it down and then it would be wet for the next person. So I'm very grateful to say that uh, most of the headsets now that are being used have either they're made of like a harder plastic or um, they have like a rubber piece that you can fit over the foamy portion of the headset. So everything is much easier to wipe down with wipes. Plus, they don't need any like special wipes. Some of the previous ones I had to have like a certain kind of wipe. Now I can just use my basic Clorox wipes and we're good. So I can get those from the, you know, the school nurse. And then, um, you know, another thing I've been looking at and I haven't plunged into this yet is some people are also using like UV lights for sanitizing. So just, in, you know, trying different things to kind of clean everything up. All right. All right. Well, and you know that that's sometimes the, the solutions we come up have to change as the longer we do something and we are, we adapt, we overcome, we're librarians, we can do this. So I'll admit, I've only ever considered VR as somebody who might watch something, a consumable, um, you know, something that somebody else has made for me. And yet your students have sort of moved into the next stage of this where they are world creating. How, like, explain to me how that happened. Yeah, so I think when anyone gets started in VR, consumption is always the way I suggest people start because it's overwhelming and why not just use the things that have already been created? So once you find that that's kind of exhausting itself or your students want a new challenge because there's always kids that want to take it to like the next level, that's when you want to start having them create. And so one tool that has been probably most popular in my school and a game changer is something called CoSpaces EDU. A uh, full transparency, I'm an ambassador for them. So I do have a code I'll share with your listeners that they can have access to the pro version for 100 seats for 30 days. But before you do the pro version, the free version is awesome. And what's great about it is, is it's um, you can build on student devices. So in my school, we're one-to-one -one Chromebooks. So the students can build on their Chromebooks. And these worlds are kind of animated looking. You have like a, a play space that you can work within and it allows you to change the background environment, the lighting. There's uh, this library of different characters. So individuals, animals, you can build buildings. So people build entire cities. 
There's also animations, so you can right click on a figure and then have it, you know, laughing or jumping. And then eventually there's opportunities for coding. They have something called physics. It kind of reminds me of Angry Birds. So you can set something in motion and watch other things respond in motion as well. And so it's a really cool tool. I love it because it allows kids to just demonstrate their learning in different ways. They can also import objects. So you can actually build objects in a tool called Tinkercad and then take those files in an OBJ format and then upload it into CoSpaces. You can also record um, narration. So I've had world language teachers use it and the kids are recording in like Spanish or French or Hebrew or Mandarin. And that's amazing also. So CoSpaces is the best because it's super easy. The free version is awesome. And when you're ready, you can try the pro version and then eventually decide if you want a subscription. So I would highly recommend that. Kids have made amazing things, like way beyond anything I could imagine. Well, and I'm thinking how many, this would be a very appealing if you were writing a grant because of the applications you could have across the, the curriculum, that it's easy to envision one application, but if you can come up with a dozen different ways that across your subject areas, across grade levels, you've got, I mean, what, anytime you can support not only your, your world language teachers, but also your ELA and your social studies, I imagine you can do a lot of science applications because you're, you're dealing with, you know, outer space, you're dealing with, you know, the, the body, like you could explore and you could explore all different types of environments. And it would be a lot of fun to see the committee deciding whether or not they should fund something. And we're like, why wouldn't we? Like everybody can benefit from this technology. Yeah. And I love it because you could differentiate it. it. You can have a student that very simply just drags and drops things in, but then you could have kids creating and importing. You could have kids coding. I mean, there's so many ways to challenge students and sort of meet them where they're at. So it's an, it's an exceptional tool. You know, when I was listening to you, I, it, it reminded me of just even just the basic world building that happens in Minecraft. And so it seems to me like it would not be a stretch to get your students to work with this platform because so, for so many of them, they are accustomed to creating a Minecraft world. I think I find that the only frustration that your Minecrafters have is that they're so used to these worlds being infinite and they just keep going, whereas co-spaces you have to work within a play space. So if you need additional space, you have to add additional spaces. So there almost becomes like a list. But our Minecraft students are are quick to just dive in and do it. They're amazing. You know, as librarians are inclined to do, you and Amanda Jones created a curated list of VR resources in a s'more. Uh, would you give listeners an idea of these amazing links, which you have both generously compiled and you are sharing in the show notes? Yeah, so I will make sure that you get the link to our s'more. And the s'more, Amanda's the one that put it together. I can't take any credit for that. It has access to our slide deck from our recent presentation at ALA. This is actually the second time we presented it. So we just, you know, keep improving it and adding more tools and things. And it has a wealth of resources. So both Amanda and I took some time to share different tools that we've used. And we're coming at it from totally different angles. So that's kind of fun because there's such a wide range of tools that we've shared. And what's great is everything that's there has been tried and true. And it's something that we stand by and we have been successful with students. So if you're looking to get started this is a good place to start. So otherwise it feels like a shot in the dark sometimes. As I've s said many times, like don't, you don't have to go create something when something has already been created. So, you know, starting with some of these free, the free content out there is probably the best way to go, uh, especially as you're kind of dipping your toe in the water. So take a look. Well, and, and I've said this many times, you know, I, there's no one I trust more to compile resources that they have gone through with fidelity and looked and scrutinized than another set of school librarians because I, I absolutely trust them. You know, VR, like all technology, is constantly evolving. What are some possible applications do you see for students in the near future? So I'm really excited because VR initially, students knew it from like the gaming perspective. And what's great is that I think it's kind of making its way in the ed space a lot more. Initially in education, it was very focused on science and engineering, which makes sense because there's a lot of like hands-on interactive components to VR that are there. 
But I, as a previous ELA and social studies teacher and current librarian, love the focus on the humanities. I think as we focus more on empathy, social emotional learning in general in our world and trying to be more aware and understanding of others, I'm excited to see that there's a big push for more humanities based applications. So I'm hearing that, you know, there's more cinematic VR films being made, which I think is always super powerful. I know there's some film companies that are trying to reenact historical events or take current events and and bring them in VR. So you're actually there at protests or these um, incredible pivotal events to learn from. And so I'm really excited because to me, it's about raising glo- global consciousness. And this idea of sharing story and history to me is an innate part of what it means to be human. And I feel like VR is really embracing that. So I'm excited to see what's coming for us. I can't help but think because we are... I- I am very aware, as many people are, that right now our weather has dictated a great deal of of how people are living their lives right now. We have not been able to escape many things that are happening in the the extreme, the extreme weather that, that so many people around the globe are experiencing. And I think that when you're talking about building empathy, Wouldn't it be interesting to see how VR could be used to hopefully open people's eyes to the immediate implications that so many people around the world are feeling when it comes to global warming and climate change? Because there are still people who don't believe that this is actually a thing. And I don't mean to get political on this on this uh, podcast, but, you know, when it talks about building empathy the experiences that people are feeling perhaps a half a world away, um, what better way to do this than to create an immersive experience where somebody who's living, uh, you know, sort of in a space where you're not feeling those kinds of effects might be able to experience something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, you, I'm thinking about climate migrants. Like, I think that would be so powerful to, to follow along with a cli- climate migrant and like, what are they enduring And I didn't get to mention this, and I should share this. One of my findings was, so you know what, before I talked about, you know, that increase in empathy, males, uh, adolescent males had the greatest increase, which was kind of interesting. But I I think the reason that happens is is that girls are already high to begin with. uh, But the boys had a 22.6% increase in effective empathy, like being able to feel what someone else felt, and had an 11.8% increase in cognitive empathy. And that was after watching an 11-minute film called The Displaced. I, it was remarkable to have that big of an increase from an 11-minute film. Well, and I, I can't help but think, you know, we struggle as, as educators sometimes to really evoke those kinds of emotions from students because it, it takes a great deal of work on, on our part to create a situation where they can develop those kinds of emotions but you put a VR headset on them and surround them with the immediacy of what you want to learn about in class, I imagine that you are instantly creating a the, the circumstances for a much richer conversation from, from students who would otherwise not feel nearly as emotionally involved in, in something content-wise in your classroom. Yeah, and like no one's there to judge you. So I'm thinking you're in this headset and no one's going to see, because some kids took the headset off. They're like, I kind of cried a little. And I don't know that they would have done that in class because they would have been embarrassed. They're seventh graders. They don't want anyone to see that. It's too vulnerable. So I think there is something about being immersed in this little private space and truly allowing yourself, like letting it all out and letting and being vulnerable and allowing yourself really into this story. I think it's so powerful. Wow. You know, Andrew Trudeau, I am so grateful we were able to join you with sort of touching base with you on your journey uh, with your PhD and and uh, catch you during the summer. You're one of my uh, heroes because uh, during the summer, it's awfully hard to catch people while they are uh, on vacation. So I, I'm really, really grateful. And and you and I, are, are you're part of my PLN. I rely on you uh, on a regular basis. And I know other people would benefit from following you. Would you let us know how we can follow you on social media? Uh, I appreciate that not everybody wants to 
to be tuned in during the summer. But uh, on some level, I got to tell you, connecting with you has has really helped, been helpful to me, uh, as, both professionally and just navigating, uh, you know, all the challenges that that our jobs bring us. Oh, right back at you, Amy. I am so grateful you're at my TLN. <laughs> um, I, our, I mean, we are islands as librarians. I'm the only one holding this position in my school. So to have people all around the nation and the world that understand it, it means so much. So to find me, you're best off looking on Twitter, or should I call it X now? I don't know how I feel about this. Um, and I'm at Andrea underscore Trudeau. I'm also trying out threads. I know everyone's trying to like jump to something else and we're not sure what's going on, but I'm there. I'm not totally active yet, but I've got an account going. And there my handle is Andrea underscore Trudeau one, the number one. Um, lastly, I'd suggest you check out my website, which is notrushlibrarian.com. And I worked so hard on it. And if you want to geek out over VR, you are welcome to check out my recently published academic article in Computers and Education X Reality called Breaking the Fourth Wall, the Effects of Virtual Reality Film Viewing on Adolescent Students Empathic Responses. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Friends, I, I got to tell you, I love when librarians share, and, and this is a, an opportunity to do that deep dive. So, you know, Andrew Judeau, I hope you have a great rest of the summer and enjoy your family time. And then when you get back to school, I mean, I know that we're going to reconvene those conversations because we're going to be back into it. Thank you so much, Amy. As with all the episodes which are being recorded and shared out over the summer months, I am grateful to Andrea and to all my guests whose generosity of their time and talents have made these episodes possible. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider sending some fan mail to Andrea and adding her to your virtual PLN. One last friendly reminder, friends, use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more and schedule your first literati book fair and receive a $500 Tidal Wave gift card. As always, there are links in the show notes. The topic of our next episode will be Redefining Research and My Conversation with Lisa Chibi. I hope you will tune in.